Thank you. My name is Marianne Thieme and I'm a member of parliament for the Party for the Animals in the Netherlands. And our party is the very first in the world to champion the rights of non-humans in a national parliament. However, there are other problems in the world aside from animal welfare. So tonight I'm going to tell you some very hard truths about what we are doing to our planet. And I'm so pleased that you are ready to face up to these realities. If you look at the 10 hottest years ever measured, they've all occurred in the last 14 years. The world is heating up fast and we have ourselves to blame. Global warming is real, and we humans are almost certainly the cause. Global warming, that's the world's greatest current concern. Everyone finds themselves in its grip, from scientists to politicians to the Secretary General of the UN and even Leonardo DiCaprio. We face a convergence of crises. Industrial civilization has caused irreparable damage. By the middle of the century, there may be 150 million environmental refugees. Not only is it the 11th hour, it's 11.59. But it's that other film made by Nobel Prize winner Al Gore, which has truly succeeded in putting this global problem on the map. An inconvenient truth was a real wake-up call to the world. This was a great achievement for Al Gore. However, he forgot something rather important. The consequences of global warming are enormous. The climate researchers from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change have estimated that by the year 2100, one to three billion people will be in dire need of fresh water. Hunger will increase throughout large parts of the globe. So, it should come as no surprise that global warming is currently our foremost concern. Everyone who has seen Al Gore's film knows that our Earth is in bad shape. Greenhouse gas emissions must be reduced. This is on the agenda of every world leader. The causes of global warming must be dealt with now. And so, together we must identify the greatest emitters of greenhouse gases in our society. What do you think? What are the sources of greenhouse gases? The cars we're driving and the water waste and all the trash we don't care where, where we're throwing it. That's what I think. Cars, buses. It's industry, it's gasoline, it's energy use. All the fumes from car. Cars, too many vehicles maybe. Fumes in the air, all the gas and people driving in the city. Cars, factories. Planes. I imagine the aviation industry hasn't helped. I mean, one airplane can fly across country and it's like 40 tons of, of carbon. 40 tons, that's a lot. I think in one word, I would say pollution. Coal power stations, gas power stations. People using more energy than they need to. We are wasting a lot. Of An excessive use of, of gases. And also coal burning stations, especially in China. All the pollutants that we pump into the air day after day. Everyone says the same thing. It's the cars, the planes, the industrial plants. It's because we leave our lights on and take long showers. Always the same familiar answers. And, well, yes, of course it's true. But no one has yet won the grand prize. Because we're forgetting one extremely important factor. 18% of global greenhouse gas emissions are caused by livestock farming. That might surprise you. Farmed animals, 18%. And guess what percentage of total global emissions are caused by transport? 13%. Just think, all the cars, tractors, trucks, ships and planes in the world added together emit fewer greenhouse gases than livestock farming. Oh, really? Wow, I thought it was mostly cars. 
Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> Livestock. That's crazy. So more than the cars. Are you serious? Yeah, I didn't know that. That's insane. No, I did not know that. No. Uh, that's news to me. I've never heard that. I'd never heard the livestock connection, no. Well, I knew there was some. I had no idea it was that extensive. How does it come from livestock exactly? What do you call cow farts? <laughs> what do you call that? Okay. Yeah, the methane gas coming from the cows. Yeah. It's cow shit, right? Doesn't cow poop? It's the, what the emissions, right? I thought it was just fat people in the South here in America, but no, apparently it's cattle as well. It's quite worrying. <laughs> okay. Well, I saw an article that say uh, because the cow, what they fast, mm -hmm. and then actually the fasting make the global warming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But how how can it be that farm animals plays a heavier burden on the environment than the entire transport sector worldwide? Well, actually, it's rather simple. Once upon a time, a farmer was someone who owned land and some animals. Nice and quiet around here. If there was more land, then he bought some more pigs, a few chickens and some cows. Well, that's a fine kettle of fish. You know what? All that grubbing around outside takes far too long. We're going to fatten you up and fast. It's not a fairy tale storybook. You're there to be eaten. Uh, not sure that's such a compliment, really. We'll squeeze you all together nice and efficiently, and you'll all get sick right away. You're telling me. Listen, Piggy, I'm not interested in your personal vision right now. In the Netherlands alone, you lot produce 70 billion kilos of dung. Do you know how bad that is for the environment and the climate? Uh... Sorry for living. Did you know that cows of all farm animals are the largest producers of greenhouse gases, mostly through all that belching and farting? Do you know what the problem is? You're eating us out of house and home. Who was just so pleased about fending us up? But all that food has to come from somewhere, doesn't it? So we destroy the rainforests and plant soya crops instead. But the rainforests are really important for the absorption of carbon dioxide. And then we spray the stuff with pesticides and we ship the soya off to Europe where it ends up in your feeding troughs. So well organized. What are you people up to? Oh, oh, well that's not our fault. <laughs> Who actually wants to eat meat anyway? The consumer, okay? Is there something wrong with that? Well, that's a good question. Who actually eats so much meat? Eating meat is a luxury that we've got all rather too used to. Don't dare touch our steaks. Keep your hands off our barbecues. But once it becomes clear that all this meat is making a major contribution to the destruction of our Earth, shouldn't we think again? And yes, I hear some of you thinking, here we go again, yet another vegetarian fanatic. But I'm certainly not the only one who's worried about this issue. I'm Hugh McConaughey, I'm farm manager. We farm a thousand hectares of land in uh, mid Wales. Uh, we have around 800 head of cattle, including uh, 550 dairy cows. We have 3,000 head of sheep, um, and we grow some arable crops. We can't deny it as farmers, as agriculturists, that uh, methane produced by cows contributes um, to global warming. I'm David Davis. I work at the Institute of Biological, Environmental and Rural Sciences at Aberystwyth University. Cows have a very complex digestive tract, more complex than humans. Within their stomach, they are able to digest plant fibre, and humans cannot. 
to do that, they need a very complex mix of bacteria and fungi and protozoa within their digestive system. Now these microorganisms do not have access to oxygen and the food that we eat as people gets converted into carbon dioxide and water. Because ruminants in the rumen don't have access to oxygen, they need to produce a different range of end products. And one of the key ones from the rumen is methane. When you compare with carbon dioxide, methane is 21 times more potent. The cow eats the feed in front of it, um, and it goes into its stomach, and, and as a result of that, the cow burps a lot. And this uh, gas, which is produced when the animal burps, uh, is one of the, the gases uh, linked to the warming and the greenhouse effect. Every cow and every ruminant regurgitates its food into the mouth to chew, and this enables the, the microorganisms in, in the stomach to actually get better access to that feed. And whilst they're regurgitating it, they're actually releasing methane. So every time the cud, as it's called, comes into the mouth, a small amount of gas will also be released, and this will contain a large proportion of methane. No, we don't notice anything about it, because it's just a, a natural process which occurs in all ruminants. The dairy cow that's producing eight to 10,000 litres of milk every year will produce around five to 700 litres of methane every day. So your average cow will produce around 700 litres of methane per day. This is equivalent to the amount of greenhouse gas CO2 emissions produced by a big four by four vehicle traveling around 35 miles per day. The rumen population within the world is probably growing um, and it has to grow in line with the growth in population in order to feed that population. I think it should concern everybody. In 2006, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, the FAO, published an important report which first brought the link between livestock farming and climate change to light. I'm now going to speak to Dr. Henning Steinfeld, the chief author of this report. Dr. Steinfeld, you have calculated that livestock farming is responsible for 18% of greenhouse gas emissions. That's quite a lot. In fact, 18% is quite a lot. It has to do with the fact that in this assessment, we took into account all the changes in land use that are related to livestock, the production of animals in terms of methane, the manure management in terms of also methane and nitrous oxides, and the various steps of the feed production, livestock production, processing, transport, and so on, that have to do with livestock and feed commodities. And this is how you get to 18%. Okay. How did you respond yourself when you were confronted with these figures? I knew it was high. I knew also the impact on water and biodiversity was going to be very significant. I didn't expect it to be quite as high, but uh, this is the figure we came up with. And what do you think? What was the most shocking, amazing conclusion from your report? Well, I think one of the issues is that uh, this um, huge environmental impact that livestock have is not well understood by the public. It is not even well understood by the farmers themselves. So there is uh, actually a strong case for regulating the livestock sector much more than is currently the case. Thank you. Everyone is talking about global warming and trying to find out why it is happening. But how can it be that livestock farming is hardly ever mentioned as one of its causes? Certainly when more and more scientists have made the link between livestock farming and climate change. It's not generally known, but um, between 40 and 50 percent of all cereals are not eaten by uh, humans, but by um, livestock. And for soy, that's about 75 percent. If you consider that it takes about seven kilograms of grain, that's corn and soybeans, to just make one kilogram of beef, 
we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of hectares of soy being planted in former rainforest to, to provide meat. That's not a very efficient way of, uh, of producing protein food. The soy is being import imported from places like Brazil. Brazil has the biggest soy export market in the world. And their soy production has grown since the 1960s, something like 57 times. So they're just producing more soy than ever before. And most of that soy is being produced in very environmentally sensitive areas, including the Amazon rainforest and the Cerrado, which is a woodland savanna. What can I say? It's a disaster. The main drawback is uh, losing biodiversity, but um, uh, indirectly it's also influ influencing uh, uh, climate change. It's uh, speeding up the climate change that's already occurring. Carbon sinks are places in the world like the rainforest or the Cerrado or some agricultural lands that soak up and sequester carbon. And, and when those are lost, we're losing a very important tool in the fight against global warming. Today, there's nothing more important than trying to contain the problem of global warming. And to do that, we cannot afford not to pay attention to agriculture. If we want to just achieve a fairly conservative objective in this sector, which is to stop this sector adding more by the middle of the century, then we have to take quite radical steps because um, the natural dynamic is that as populations get richer, they almost universally consume more animal products. In the global context at the moment, this, is, this, this argument really in a way focuses on China because China is the biggest increaser in meat consumption. You know, it's doubling every 10 years. The population of pigs and chickens in China is doubling every 10 years. These are monogastric animals. They don't create a, environment, a greenhouse gas problem in terms of methane release, but they do create environmental problems because they have to be fed and the feedstuffs have to come from global sources and they come from soybean production in Brazil, which comes from deforestation and so on. If the rich countries keep on consuming at their high level and countries like China come up to our high level, then the situation will be much worse and that will make it very much more difficult to achieve global warming targets overall. So it's rather strange that most governments only focus on quick fixes, like taxes on gas guzzlers. Certainly when you realise that research shows that in a year a cow in the Netherlands will produce just as many greenhouse gas emissions as a car that drives 70,000 kilometers. 70,000 kilometers. This means driving around the globe more than one and a half times in a medium-sized car, I should add. <laughs> the image we get to see of global warming is always so one-sided. We only get to see factory chimneys and traffic jams. Where are the public information campaigns about the relationship between carbon emissions and eating meat? I certainly haven't seen them yet in the Netherlands, despite the fact that we slaughter 500 million animals here each year. Animals, however, discover exactly what factory farming is very early on in their lives. Piglets, for example, are castrated without anesthetic. Their tails are docked, they are forced to live in dark concrete stalls and usually only see daylight when they are taken to slaughter. It's not much different for other factory farmed animals. Take laying hens, for example. They are crammed into battery cages and their beaks are trimmed to stop them from pecking one another. 
Since 2006, I have represented the Party for the Animals in the Dutch Parliament, and I strive to put an end to these kind of practices. But my work doesn't just stop at animal welfare. It's only recently that the Dutch Environmental Agency has sounded the alarm at the speed at which we are exhausting the earth and its resources. The Netherlands uses four times its own surface area to produce what we consume. Think of it like a buffet. We are heaping up our plates with enough food to feed four people, which means that there will be not enough left for those at the back of the queue. One billion people on our planet suffer from obesity, while elsewhere, one billion people go to bed hungry every night. Something is seriously askew, and we should really talk about it. Right now, half of the total global wheat harvest is used as livestock feed to support our meat and dairy consumption. Half of the entire harvest, while at the same time, people in poor countries are starving. And there doesn't seem to be an end to this. We keep on consuming more and more and more. And in the future, we'll have to exploit other people's natural resources even more than we do now. And this will be at the expense of those people. Clean water, clean air, and also our environment. So let me sum this up for you. Scientists say that it simply takes far more land and energy to produce animal protein than plant-based ones. To produce animal products, you need up to 10 times as much land as needed to produce vegetable products. And this is due to the fact that all this land is needed to produce feed for these billions of farm animals. Films like An Inconvenient Tooth have made a very important contribution to the debate on global warming. Yet the only cow that I saw on screen symbolized little else picture-perfect youth in Tennessee. In the whole Inconvenient Tooth, not a single word was said about livestock farming or the impact of this polluting industry. Dr. Steinfeld, how is it possible that livestock doesn't play a role in the discussion about global warming? Well, I think that uh, the fact is that uh, in the climate change discussion, much of the focus is on carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide emissions, if you look at the livestock sector, only make up about one third of the total greenhouse gas emissions. Nitrous oxides and methane don't come very strongly into the debate, but they are uh, much more uh, potent in terms of greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide and they need to be factored in. But Al Gore didn't say one single word about the livestock industry in his documentary. What do you think? Didn't you miss the aspect as well? Uh, it is certainly missing. Uh, the entire aspect of food is missing. And I think uh, everyone needs to know that uh, food and agriculture uh, contributes to climate change and has environmental impact and uh, one needs to make choices if one wants uh, to be environmentally friendly that are in line with uh, the environmental impact of producing various types of food. Well, I think he should have said something about it. Have you ever tried to convince him? Well, I, I'm not uh, someone who knows Al Gore personally. Uh, I think that uh, at my level, uh, publishing results and uh, talking at conferences and talking to the media, such as in this case, is all I can do. Well, thank you. He doesn't know it either. So I went to the United States to find an answer to this question. Unfortunately, Elgo was busy, but I did manage to speak to some other people who had quite a bit to say on the subject. Great. Hello. Hi. Hi. Information. Thank you. Have a nice day. Hi. Hello. Hi. 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 Nice, nice to, to meet you, you finally. Yeah. Yeah. You do such great work. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Having a good time. Yeah. Yeah. What are you doing here? Well, we're out here trying to show people that if they're eating meat, 
-hmm. They're engaging in the number one most environmentally destructive behavior they could engage in and uh, showing people that rather than cars and trucks and SUVs, even rather than planes, meat is the number one cause of global warming. Do people believe that when you tell them? People are shocked to find out. We hear so much about cars and trains and planes and energy, yeah. and people don't realize that it's actually the meat on their plate that's causing uh, global warming rather than the car that they're driving even. Get you some information here? Thank you. Thank you. How's it going? There you go, check that out when you get a chance. Thank you. Check that out, thank you. We use this catchy phrase, climate change. It's uh, really just a way to grab attention and get people to look in our direction mm -hmm. long enough for us to give them a leaflet and explain the issue a little bit further. Uh -huh. And uh, get them to go home wondering, how is it that meat causes global warming, rather than wondering, uh, what's on television tonight? Or what am I going to have for dinner tonight? Hey there. One of these. Thank you. Saying that power plants are the number one cause of global warming is like saying that humans are the number one cause of global warming. Power plants don't emit energy, don't create energy for the purpose of just creating energy for the sake of it. They create it for industries. And one of the industries that uses the most energy is factory farming. Up now, Mr. Prescott. All right. In the U.S., the meat industry uses about one-third of all the fossil fuels that we generate. Headquarters of People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, in short, PETA. They have almost two million members and are active worldwide. I love this one as well. Oh, yes. This is very famous one. We've got this. I suspect that for Al Gore and for a lot of other people, it's just too inconvenient of a truth. Gore was a politician and is beholden to a lot of industry people in, in uh, many, many different industries, probably in the meat industry too. And uh, while he certainly has done admirable work, it's disheartening to say the least that he has continued to ignore the fact that the meat he's eating every night for dinner is the number one cause of global warming. I'm Alicia Silverstone, and I'm a vegetarian. There's nothing in the world that's changed me as much as this. I feel so much better and have so much more energy. It's so amazing. There's a prominent environmental group in the U.S. called Environmental Defense, and they recently wrote on their website that if every American replaced chicken with vegetarian foods in just one meal per week, it'd be the equivalent uh, in carbon dioxide of taking about 500,000 cars off of U.S. roads. Here in the United States, big is beautiful. This applies to the cars and definitely to the steaks. The average American eats 124 kilos of meat a year, 44 more kilos than the average Dutchman. At night, at the hotel, I watch a classic about American factory farming. Here you go, Leo. Psst. Leo. Who are you? And how did you know my name? I am Mufius. And I know a lot about you. Have you heard of the Matrix? The Matrix? Do you want to know what it is? Okay. The Matrix is all around you, Leo. It is the story we tell ourselves about where meat and animal products come from. This family farm is a fantasy. Take the blue pill and stay here in the fantasy. Take the red pill and I'll show you the truth. Welcome to the real world. Wow! What is this horrible place? This is a factory farm, Leo. Places like this are where most eggs, milk, and meat come from. How did this happen? I'll show you. 
In the mid-20th century, greedy agriculture corporations began modifying sustainable family farming to maximize their profits at great cost to both humans and animals. Factory farming was born. Animals are packed as closely together as possible. Most never see sunlight, touch ground, or get fresh air. Many can't even turn around. These cruel conditions cause fights and disease amongst the animals. To fix this, the corporate machine began systematic mutilations, practices such as debeaking chickens. And they started adding a constant dosage of antibiotics to their feed just to keep these poor wretches alive. This overuse of antibiotics breeds super strains of resistant disease-causing germs. Every day we get closer to an epidemic that cannot be stopped. Ew! What's that smell? 12 million pounds of excrement. This pollutes the air and groundwater. That's why communities near factory farms often suffer from high levels of related sicknesses. Well, it smells like shh. And what's more, factory farming corporations have been destroying communities and mistreating their workers for decades. Since 1950, over two million small hog farms have disappeared. If they continue at this rate, there'll be no real independent family farms left. That is the Matrix, Leo. The lie we tell ourselves about where our food comes from. But it's not too late. There is a resistance. Count me in! Washington, city of politicians, policymakers, lobbyists, and activists. Think of the seals when you buy your milk. Boycott Canada. Today, a demonstration against the seal hunt is held at the Canadian Embassy. Think of the seals when you buy your meals. This demonstration was organized by the Humane Society of the United States, America's largest animal welfare organization with 10 million members. 30 minutes later, I have an appointment on Capitol Hill with Wayne Purcell, the president of the Humane Society. Hi. Hello there. Hello Hi. There. Welcome to the United States. Welcome to Washington, our nation's capital. Thank you. And we're so proud of what you've accomplished in Thank Holland you. with your election. We all took note last November of how you were elected, and you're the first party for the animals in the, in the world yeah, to achieve this. Yeah, true. So thank you, and thank we look you. forward to learning about what you've done. Oh, okay, okay, so nice to meet you finally. You're the biggest organization on animal welfare. Yes, we, we are. We have 10 million supporters here in the United States in terms of paying supporters. Yeah. And then, of course, we have millions more who believe in what we're doing, and we're here to organize that sentiment mm -hmm. to achieve political reforms for animals, okay. among doing other things. We. We try to pressure corporations to do the right thing, and we educate the public, and we do hands-on care of animals as well. But the political work here in Congress is very important. Hey. Hey. Oh, <laughs> you guys quit. Right. One, two. Factory farming is the biggest abuse of all, because in the United States alone, there are 10 billion animals raised for food. It's an extraordinary number, and the average yeah. American eats 80 or 85 animals per year. And we want to see that number reduced, and we want to see the animals out of these terrible confinement systems. Why do you think Al Gore didn't mention factory farming? You know, I, I think that he probably thought that, that um, he was giving a lot of information already mm -hmm. to people with an inconvenient truth, and maybe he thought people would shut down if it affected them too personally. Because it gets very personal when you're talking about eating animals and you're talking about something that is part of the American diet. Uh, I thought, oh, this is going too far. But the public is slowly waking up. I do not believe that we can have a good situation for animals or the environment if we continue to eat as much meat as we are eating. But even if you reduce your total consumption by half, and instead of eating 80 animals, eat 40, you cut in half the greenhouse gas emissions. So we do think that our fork is a powerful tool. 
So they're clear about this in the United States. The power lies with the consumer. As consumers, we can make a difference by changing our diets. Matt Prescott says that meat is the number one cause of global warming, and he gives a good example of this. If every American ate no chicken for just one day a week, then this would reduce just as much pollution as taking 500,000 cars off the road. <laughs> it's funny. Okay, I can hear you thinking meat and other animal products are bad for the environment. Ah, I get it. But don't we need meat and milk for our health? Where else do we get the calcium for our bones, the iron for our blood and the vitamins and minerals we need to keep us healthy? Advertisers and food producers have done so much to indoctrinate us that you nearly end up believing us. The message is clear. Milk is essential, meat is good for you, cheese is healthy for us all. But who benefits most from meat and dairy products? The consumer or the producer? Do we really need all that animal protein? Generally speaking, there's not a real problem for health if we have much lower meat consumption and there are potential benefits. I mean, after all, colon cancer is one of the commonest cancers in high-income countries and the risk of colon cancer is higher with high meat consumption. So there'll be a real benefit in terms of lowered colon cancer risk, for example. Going from our level of consumption to something that's just a bit below half of that uh, would not involve any significant health harms and would almost certainly bring health benefits. As you probably already guessed, I'm a vegetarian. I actually used to like eating meat quite a lot. But that was until around 12 years ago when I saw a Dutch TV documentary called What the Cow Wants. It contained some really bizarre footage. Deze pens kunnen jullie eens een paar jaar geleden gemaakt. En daar kunnen koeien heel lang mee blijven leven. Soms wel meer dan tien jaar. Die, dat is eigenlijk is dat een gat met een diameter van een tien centimeter. Daarin zit een siliconen ring met erin geklemd een deksel. Als ik nu druk, dan moet het mogelijk zijn om deze deksel naar binnen te drukken. Nu is die open. De deksel is eruit, kan eruit. En hier hebben we dus een gedeelte van de grassilage die het dier zojuist gegeten heeft. When I saw this, for me that was the very limit. Animal diseases, animal suffering, animals that were no longer treated as living beings. I had seen it all, and I thought. No, not in my name. I want no part in this anymore. En zo kan het deksel je er weer op. In the factory farming industry, animals are adapted to the food that we choose to give them and to the massive stalls in which they are forced to live. They are mutilated, they are giving antibiotics to stop them getting sick. Pigs are now sometimes even given anti-stress pills to help them cope with their unnatural living conditions. Yet the fact that it turns out that livestock makes an enormous contribution to greenhouse gas emissions by belching, farting and defecating doesn't necessarily mean that we'll start keeping fewer cows, pigs and chickens. No, the industry will simply dream up something new. Would you believe it? They now even make fist-sized pills to stop cows from farting so much. But you know, consumer resistance against factory farming is steadily growing due to increasing awareness of animal suffering that it entails. 
And sometimes you come across people from an entire different background who surprise you. It was in America that I met a man who is known as the Mad Cowboy. He was a factory farmer who got out of the livestock industry and went vegetarian around the time of the mad cow disease crisis in Europe. Hi, nice to finally meet nice, you. Nice to see you're unlost again. Yeah, finally, we my, made it. my humble abode. Thank you. It's nice and warm here. This is, this is on the farm, and uh, this is one of the dogs we had, which was Sam, good critter. That's the farm. I'm a fourth generation farmer, rancher, feedlot operator from Montana. At one time, I had 7,000 head of cattle, 12,000 acres of crop, and 30 employees. I spent 45 years of my life in production agriculture. Not something I learned from a book. I learned it by doing it. I was a factory farmer, the worst of all. Not a family farmer, but a factory farmer. Never met a chemical I didn't like. Uh, we'd actually grind up animals and feed them back to our animals. Uh, had all of the bad habits. What are you doing here? Branding. Oh. See there? I branded hundreds of thousands of it's animals. It's still allowed. It's still allowed in America. Absolutely. 1979, I ended up paralyzed from the waist down. Uh, doctor told me I had a tumor on my spinal cord. He said, if that tumor is on the inside of the cord, you have less than one chance in a million you will ever walk again. Made me stop and think for the first time in my life, that I was part of the problem, not part of the solution. I saw the birds die, I saw the trees die, I saw the soil changed, and it was not until I was paralyzed that I was willing to admit that I was the problem. I ended up with a one in a million operation. I've walked out of the hospital with a one in a million operation but I walked out a much different individual than I walked in. I knew that what we were doing was wrong, was absolutely, totally non-sustainable. Here's a, a scone that my wife made. Try that. Vegan. Everything in the house is vegan. Yeah. There's. There's no animal products in, in anything that we have here. Oh, and, and it tastes good. Everybody thought the same way. It was mass hysteria. Everybody was doing it. It must be okay. You started from the time you were a child. And can you imagine what it was like when I first asked myself the question, should we be eating animals? It was one of the most uh, thought-provoking questions I ever had in my life because I had never even considered that. No. And when you stop and think about it, it is so straightforward and open. Should we eat animals? Absolutely not. Do we need them for protein? Absolutely not. Are they good for us? Absolutely not. Do they enjoy us eating them? Absolutely not. My hometown newspaper put my picture in the front page and it said, Montana's most famous vegetarian. I picked up the phone and I called him up and I said, why don't you tell it the way it is? Montana's only vegetarian. And they said, now we have one of you kind of guys here at the paper, so we know there are two. But people, 
People don't want to believe that somebody that from the inside of the industry, you know, that when you look at it, the one thing when I debate the issue with somebody from the industry, their common defense is, oh, well, you don't understand. I spent 45 years of my life there. There's nothing that they have done that I haven't done more of it. I've milked more cows, I've slopped more pigs, I've fed more animals. And when they tell me I don't understand, I understand. And what I understand is what we're doing is wrong. It's non-sustainable. It's not good for us. It's not good for the animals. It's not good for the planet. The sooner we stop what we are doing, the better we'll all be. Did you also notice that there were, are more uh, women vegan or vegetarian than men? Well, yeah. You know why? why. Tell me why. They're smarter. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, do you know why women live longer than men? Mm, tell me. Because men have to live with women. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what I did is I went out on the road and I started talking to people. I traveled about 100,000 miles a year. It was not unusual for me to do three or four lectures a day. Some of the groups were large, some of them were small. The largest group I ever talked to was 40,000. The smallest was two. We should never count the crowd. You never know how many people that are there are going to get the information. My job was not to save the world. My job was to do everything that I could do so people would make better choices. And I've done that now for over 20 years. And I think that when I had the opportunity I was able to change the way a lot of people thought. Was it going to be enough? I don't know. But I did what I could. Do you think there are more vegetarians now? now oh, people? sure. The, uh, you know, my hometown uh, actually had a vegan restaurant. Isn't that amazing? The man that gets the Nobel Prize for the film on global warming neglects the number one cause of global greenhouse gases. Does that give you some idea of the power of the industry? That, that a man that was out there to, to change the world on global greenhouse gases, do you think he did not know about it? Or was he just unwilling to stand up to the power that they had. When I went on the Oprah show and I told a few million people that we were grinding up cows and feeding cows, they sued Oprah, Harpo Production and myself for six years in court. Cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars to protect ourselves for telling the truth. Free speech not only lives, it rocks. Maybe Al Gore was worried about the power of the industry, or maybe he was self-serving because he actually raises cattle himself. And if you look at Al since he left office, there is no doubt in my mind that he's eating well too many of them. there's something you would like that you don't see, uh, I'll get it for you. No salt or pepper. No, this, uh, this fine. What was your favorite um, meat product when you were? Hamburger. Hamburger? You ate a lot of hamburgers? Yep. The best meal in the world was pork and beans potato salad, and hamburger. I could eat that three times a day, every day. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Didn't make any difference. Really? Loved it.
turned out okay. Mm. Why so? Um, not say it turned out great. Well, mm. if my wife cooked, it'd have been better. Mm. But it just goes to show that if an old cattle farmer can do this, anybody can do it. Mm -hmm. It's it's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that we should slack off on what we're doing. But if we do everything we have the capability of doing, we will win. There's no doubt in my mind. The FAO has made some very interesting calculations. Between 1950 and the year 2000, the world population grew from 2.6 billion to 6 billion people. Yet meat production f increased fivefold, from 45 to 233 billion kilos of meat each year. It's predicted that there will be 9 billion people living on our planet by the year 2050. And what will happen with the meat production? <laughs> the meat production will double to 450 billion kilos of meat by the year 2050. And of course, the greenhouse gas emissions will double too. And I'm talking about kilos of meat every time, but of course we are talking about living and breathing animals. In a lifetime, the average European will eat seven sheep, 24 rabbits, 43 turkeys, 789 fish, a third of a horse, five cows, 42 pigs and 900 chickens. So the average European devours 1,800 animals in a lifetime. If every person on our planet were to do the same, we would need 142 billion animals every year. In truth, the agricultural sector worldwide has gone off the rails. The cycle has become completely disrupted because we have started to produce meat as cheaply and intensively as possible. Forests in South America are disappearing because Europe demands huge amounts of animal feed. The gigantic factory farming industry in the United States, the huge level of meat consumption in the Western world, all at the expense of the climate, biodiversity, drinking water, and food for the very poorest people on Earth. If we don't change our eating habits, we will be consuming 450 billion kilos of meat by 2050. What does that mean for our planet? Dr. Steinfeld, what does that mean for our planet? What's your scenario? Well, there is a pessimistic scenario, and that is that nothing is done about it, and we continue to be produce uh, animals in the way we do right now. And in that case, the environmental impact is going to deteriorate uh, beyond measure. And there is a need to urgently address this issue and to deal with waste, to deal with greenhouse gas emissions, to deal with biodiversity losses. And uh, measures are available, technology options are available, what is lacking is the political willingness to act on these and to steer the livestock sector into a more sustainable way. But suppose we eat no meat for, let's say, one day a week. Will that have any positive impact on the environment? What do you think? Well, the uh, impact of uh, livestock production is probably disproportionately high compared to other sectors. So um, reducing uh, consumption is likely to have a positive impact on the environment. What do you expect? Are we going to eat less meat in the future? I think that the human health concerns and the welfare, animal welfare concerns and the environmental concerns will be uh, increasingly appreciated by a growing number in the public and that will lead to a slow decline in, at least that's my personal prediction, to a slow decline in the consumption of meat in particular. Okay, thank you. 
Dr. Steinfeld is not very optimistic, but he also points to a lack of real political will to change things. Yet, is this enough to lead us to despair? Well, I don't think so. There are some rays of hope, tiny rays of hope. I think that is just because people simply don't know. I'm sure that if they knew, they'd want to change their eating habits. But even politicians, who you would expect to know more, haven't got the faintest clue. This became crystal clear during a recent debate on deforestation in the Dutch parliament. De ontbossing, meneer Blom, zoals u weet, wordt voor een heel groot deel ook veroorzaakt door onze intensieve veehouderij. Ja, ik vind het altijd verbazingwekkend hoe de Partij van de Dieren in staat is om een onderwerp per interruptie te, uh, te, te introduceren wat absoluut niet gaat over de tekst die ik hier vooruit sprak. U moet mij niet kwalijk nemen dat ik geen idee heb wat de relatie is tussen intensieve veederij, veehouderij en de relatie tot ontbossing. Ik weet niet waar. Het spijt me, maar dat moet ik helaas dat zie ik het u altijd niet. op schuldig blijven. Nee, dat zie ik me waarschijnlijk niet, maar ik weet het gewoon niet. Maar in fact, it's all so simple. Less meat, fewer animals, reduced greenhouse gas emissions, reduced water use and less deforestation. Johan Rank has directed music videos for Madonna, Beyoncé and Robbie Williams. And when he heard about the environmental problems caused by livestock farming, he thought, shit, man, <laughs> and made a very simple yet very effective short film that I don't want to keep from you. In May 2007, the English newspaper The Daily Mail published an article called Secret Plan to Turn Us All Veggie. And I quote, Secret plans to encourage the nation to give up eating meat are being examined by the government to help save the planet. A leaked email expresses sympathy for the environmental benefits of a mass switch to a vegan diet. That's interesting. How much could reduced meat eating contribute to carbon savings. Together with the Free University Amsterdam, the Nicholas G. Pearson Foundation set out to discover what kind of carbon savings could be made in the US if they all went without meat for one or more days. And this is the result. If all Americans ate vegetarian for seven days, they would save around 700 megatons of greenhouse gas emissions. 
that would be just the same as taking all the cars in America off the roads. Every single car. If everyone in America didn't eat meat for six days a week, this would make the same carbon savings as eliminating the total electricity use of all households in the States. This would result in carbon savings equivalent to planting 13 billion trees in your garden and letting them grow for 10 years. That's 43 trees for every American. This would result in carbon savings equivalent to halving the domestic use of all electricity, gas, oil, petroleum and kerosene in the United States. If all Americans cut out meat for three days, they would save almost 300 megatons of greenhouse gas emissions. This would have a greater impact on reducing global warming than if all cars in the US were replaced with Toyota Priuses. This would have the same positive effect on reducing greenhouse gases as replacing all household appliances like fridges, freezers, microwave ovens, dishwashers, washing machines, tumble dryers, and so on and so forth. And I mean replacing all appliances with energy efficient ones. Wouldn't that be great? What do you think? Would cutting out meat for just one day really have any effect? Well, I was flabbergasted with the result. If all Americans didn't eat meat for just one day a week, this would save 90 million plane tickets from New York to LA or from LA to New York. 90 million tickets each year just by eating no meat for just one day a week. You see, You see, a small step for a man is a giant leap for humanity and all living creatures. And you don't have to wait. You can start today with your own tasty and simple solution to the climate problem. The question we have to ask ourselves is simply, how many days a week shall I go without meat to reduce global warming? I think it would help, if, especially if they did one day a week. I think that makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference not only for the environment, but for the animals themselves and then for our bodies. Not only think it would help what you're talking about, but I think it would help the karma also. <laughs> Greenhouse gas is a really important thing. Global warming is really important. But does anybody ever talk about the amount of water it takes? There's so much waste. And I think if more people were aware of that, they would, make, they would make the choice because it's a very easy thing to do. It's a very easy choice to make to just skip meat for a day, one day a week, you know, and then one day becomes two days, and then two days becomes three days, and gradually it, it can make a significant, significant impact. Absolutely. Being a vegetarian uses one-tenth the resources than eating meat does, so obviously it would help, you know, perpetuate human life on Earth that everyone did. Hopefully it all turns around. I think it's the missing, it definitely was the missing part of the inconvenient truth. Animals are suffering, people are suffering. I mean, it, it, we need to do something quickly. You know, you can't be a meat eater and call yourself an environmentalist. You can get a lot of protein from peanuts. I was raised in Canada, meat and potatoes. I never was a big meat eater my whole life, but you're raised that way and it's really hard to, to switch gears. So um, I think when people just do, do the best they can. You should all eat less animals or maybe just none. I think that would make a tremendous difference. You don't have to go 100% vegetarian, but we don't have to just have this mass gorging of meat that happens especially in the United States of America. Yes, I, I don't expect everyone on the planet to give up all meat. I think that's unrealistic, uh, but I do think we could get people to understand that meat shouldn't be something they have for their own health <laughs> on as regular a basis as, as they do have it. People don't think twice when they eat meat People don't think twice the way their meat is manufactured. People don't think twice about those factory farming practices because it's not as close to them. But yet, if you're driving in a car, an SUV that may be much bigger and is not a hybrid possibly like your car is something that you can pick on. It's an easy thing to pick on, but we need to start picking on ourselves and we need to start picking carefully what we eat, how we eat, when we eat it, where we get it from. We need to do the research and do the work to find those things out and make ourselves smarter. So if we're gonna talk about SUVs and car emissions, we can also be smart enough to find out where most of those emissions are actually coming from.
Right. Actually, the solution to our climate problem is child's play. The production of one kilogram of beef is just as bad for the environment as driving around in the car for three hours while you left all your lights on at home. If all people in the world started eating as much meat as we do, then we'd need nearly three planets to be able to feed them all. And that's not possible. If we all didn't eat meat for three days a week, this would lead to the same carbon savings of halving the electricity use in all households in the United States. A vegetarian in a hammer produces fewer carbon emissions than a meat eater in a Toyota Prius. But a vegetarian on a bike is much better. <laughs> there are hundreds of millions of vegetarians today and many more people who have already started eating less meat. Personally, I like to call them meat leavers. No, you didn't hear me wrong. I didn't say meat cleavers, but meat leavers. And if you've heard all this and are still not convinced, if climate change doesn't really matter to you, then why not just reduce your meat consumption for the sake of the animals? Because they cannot stand up for themselves and are the direct victims of our excesses. Thank you.